The Clapper. All right. So you have a question. Somebody's got a question or you got a topic you want to jump into right away? Well, a question I received a while back. Um, accepting. So, you know, there's this trend of paying hourly wages now yep. versus fee schedules. So some companies are offering an hourly versus component. Uh, some are offering a, um, you know, that's what they're doing. They're offering an hourly. And they're basing the hourly on 712s, working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Right. And we can get into how that actually works out later on. And then they're also offering desk, quote unquote, deployments for the exact same amount as they're paying for field. So the question, person asked me, should I take a hourly field or should I take an hourly desk? And they were fairly new. I want to know which one would be the best to take. Well, I will tell you hands down, taking the hourly desk is better. You have zero expenses. You're working from home. They're going to ship you the equipment to your house if it's for State Farm or, you know, another company. You're working from home. Your house, your, your stuff, your PJs, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're working from home. And uh, you're not traveling. You're not away from your family. You're not away from your dogs. You know, yeah. um, which can be a problem because they can be a distraction. But yeah, I mean, you just have to be disciplined. Considered. All things considered, if you can thrive in that environment, you want to stay home. You know, um, it that just seemed kind of a no brainer when they're paying the exact same amount of money. I mean, what happened to me was I got offered, so I got offered a desk assignment, a desk deployment, and went the first day. I had my first day of the deployment, and then. At the end of the day, they canceled it. Oh, I remember this. I yes, remember this. they canceled it at the end of that day. And so now I'm like, well, I got nothing to do. Two days later, I get a phone call offering me a field deployment. And uh, so I took it. And right after I took the field deployment, I get called again, offer me the desk deployment. Um. You know, I would have much rather have stayed home, uh, even if I would have made less money. Okay, I'd have preferred to stay home because the expense, you know, having to pay for hotel or RV space, the fuel, running my truck every day down up and down I ten, you know, um, all that stuff it was a no brainer. I mean, oh, and, yeah. and and this thing about you know the, how they're starting to offer these hourly hourly positions for for cat adjusters. And I know that the 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 hardcore guys have been in the business forever going, oh they ruined the business or all no, these people are working cheap and, and everything else. I think what the purpose of the hourly is is whenever they need a lot of people and some of these people may not have the experience to close a lot of claims where they can make that much money doing it like the experienced guys can, at least they're getting the people out there they can that are capable of doing the job. The people can sustain themselves, pay their pay their expenses, make some money, and, and help in the overall process. You generally get an option when you're offered these hourly assignments. You generally get an option to get on a component pay or fee schedule versus the hourly. So it's not like, like whenever I was down, whenever I took the assignment, I was only offered hourly. I was not offered component. But once I got there, they saw my experience and they offered me component. Okay. Um, and I said, well, give me another week. And then things changed and then I got to work in the office every day after that so I was perfectly fine working hourly going into the office every day and not driving around all over the place right so question for you yeah. so <clears throat> on the hourly pay did you, when you showed up on site did mm -hmm. you did they, you already have claims in hand and you're already out in the field or did they send you through some orientations so when I got mine was a little bit different because there was a some confusion when I first got the phone call um, to go to Hurricane Laura I, was, I got the phone call late Tuesday, um, and they first told me to be in Birmingham on Monday. Oh, no, sorry, on Sunday for training. I hang up the phone. Not even five minutes later, they call back and said, um, be, in, be in Lafayette on, on Saturday. So 
just skip everything else, go straight to Lafayette. Um, then the next day I get a phone call. They're like, where are you at? Why aren't you here? I'm like, well, I'm not supposed to be there till Saturday. Well, you're supposed to be here at noon today. So somebody, I said, okay, I can leave, you know, I can leave and go ahead and come down there. I got down there and then they were like, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> so, of course, chaos. So pure, I got my equipment. I really didn't do anything the first couple of days I was there. However, I was getting paid. As a matter of fact, I was getting paid the second that I accepted the deployment. I was getting a day rate immediately. So um, did they pay you hourly or did they pay you a day rate at that point? That, that what they were paying me day rate until I got to the site, then it was hourly. That okay. was my understanding how that was working. Okay. Because I got a check immediately. I was like, well, I got money. <laughs> I, was, I didn't realize that they were paying me the second I said yes. Um, so then on, I was supposed to have orientation on Saturday. I already had my equipment and everything. Um, somebody sent the wrong link for the, the Zoom meeting. Why not? Yeah, they got the wrong. So they canceled that. It's already that. 2020. I mean, what else? Yep. And so I had to wait until Sunday for orientation. But I woke up on Sunday morning and I had 72 claims in my queue. And so immediately started, you know, going through those and then did the orientation and then started. Then at that point, I kind of grabbed my claims, routed my claims and started making the phone calls and spent the next 24 hours. I worked until on that Sunday when I had those 72 claims, I think I worked till one or two o'clock in the morning organizing those claims, putting oh in all my information, uh, setting up my calendar, uh, just doing all, and I knocked all those out, was up the next morning bright and early, and right at eight o'clock, I'm on the phone making phone calls, and I set all 72 appointments by six o'clock that day. Wow, and, wow. Uh, yeah, that's a long day on the phone. Yeah, but it was a lot of phone calls. Voice. But I made it, you know, I, I, and I got it. So then the next day, uh, and that was on Monday, they had, I was advised, uh, don't set any field appointments until Wednesday or Thursday, because you need to get you need time to set all this stuff up. Well, you know, I'm done. I'm done. by right. mo- I'm done by Monday. And so, uh, but in the process of that, you know, when I'm setting my appointments, I got two cancellations. Mm-hmm. You know, those are closed claims. People withdrew their claims. So yeah, they, you yeah. get, they were assigned, you closed them, you get credit it for counts. that. And then three others were real simple, easy, not much. Just uh, took care of those over the phone and closed those. And then the next day I was actually in the help center and there were people that were extremely green and didn't know what they were doing and they were having problems. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm there you know, helping people in the help center. Um, they're like, Hey, go ask that guy. And, uh, <laughs> I'm like, going, what, am I getting paid for that? So, yeah, uh, right. so I was, yeah. yeah, so I, uh, so I was helping people in the help center that day. And then I finally went out in the field by that Wednesday. So I was actually there for a week before I actually went out in the field and, and started looking at claims. Wow. So, so you were getting paid an hourly while you were doing orientation. And then when you first got rolling into did you ever get on component pay no i didn't i was going i was that discussion was happening but you know of course the story goes my knee um my knee flared up on me real bad and so they put me on restricted duty and then they started giving me what we call i call them quitter claims um so they they just started well you know you work in the office you know you can't get on the roof for a few days so um they were just transferring. They took a few off of me that I had scheduled over for the next couple of days, gave them to somebody else. Then somebody had quit. They gave me their claims. The person had already scoped them, had photos and everything else. So I just took their scope notes, their photos. I wrote the claims. Right. You right. know, clo- talked to the homeowners, closed them, yep. uh, did that. And then as we progressed, they said, okay, you're, this is all you're going to do. You're just going to. You're just going to stay here and you're going to work these claims as people quit. We're going to give you those. And so basically what I, at that point I was doing was I was taking the claims of people who quit and I was, if I could close them, if I could write them and close them, I'd write them and close them. If they needed to be reassigned back out to the field, uh, I would send them back and, and they would, uh, they get, uh, reassigned. Yeah. But I closed, I mean, I was closing, you know, five, sometimes eight claims a day. You know, yeah. You're these, just sitting there in, in the yeah, room. sitting in the office, just doing that. And some, I'd work it for my work for my RV some days, and some days I'd be in the help center all day. And, and the other thing they had me doing was it was I was helping other people. You know, and of course, me being an old guy sitting there, you know, and I'm there all day long. All the young 
whippersnappers are coming over me going, man, can you give me some help with this? And so I was helping out with the with the young people as well. So <laughs> that needed help. Yeah. So um, and it was fun. I had a blast doing it. So, but you know, so the pay was good, and I was getting paid. You know, you're getting paid seven twelfths. I mean, twelve hours a day, seven days a week. Right. You know, you're making, you know, for what I was making, sitting there not doing anything. I mean, it's not driving around, not doing anything, but. You know, I was working, sitting in one place, making the same amount of money had I been at home, you know, on a desk job. And being at home, man, it was, you know, you're making, making good. I mean, if you're going to complain about getting started in this business and making four grand a week plus, you know, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> right. And if you go, well, I can't, I can't believe they're going to pay me that per hour. And like, yeah, but you're making over four grand a week. With low, ex- yeah, with low expectations on you, right? And you I, I think uh, I, I, I'm gonna imagine that the the hourly rate, it's just another way to pay a day rate. Yeah, it's just another way to pay day rate. So That's they broke it, it down, and it may be a tax thing or something. The reason why they're doing it, it that way, it has to do with the employer employee relationship that's being required now, right? Right. In that industry, so it's so. not like it's oh they're paying field adjusters hourly now. It's that they're doing what they always did. Even when I went out, when I went on my very first ever hurricane where they were bringing piles of new people in, right. they did exactly the same thing. You get day rate, you show up on a storm site and you go through three days of orientation, you're getting day rate those three days. You get day rate until you get claims. Right. And it's, it was 400 and some bucks a day. Right. right. 15 years ago. Um, same deal. You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. And it took me a little while, took me some time to kind of get my brain wrapped around this because I saw a lot of people washing out like you. I mean, you right. still the same thing today. Um, it's a cost of doing business. You know, we talk about the carrier has rules about how soon, you know, once after the insured files a claim, how soon do they have to be contacted? How soon do they have to be inspected? How soon do they have to do this, that, and the other thing? You know, every seven days, every 14 days, every 30 days, I have to have a phone call or a letter right. updating them on the status of the claim, blah, blah, blah. They do that. They, they, they throw literally in some cases tens of thousands of warm bodies at these storms yep. right and all, most of those people wash out right quitter claims you get them you know when i showed up on katrina i had claims that had had already had like three four five adjusters on them which i was like excuse i'm so sorry sir you know yep. i'll be there in yep. two hours you know whatever um the hourly thing once it's I don't. I think it's a non-issue. Right. Let's, let's put it that way, based on what I know about the way they just pay for people just to show up. Now, if you are, if they have you on hourly while you're working claims, then in a way they're still paying because, like, once they assign claims to you before this, the whole hourly thing, mm-hmm. you weren't going to get a day rate. You were right. getting comp- you were getting fee schedule. Fee schedule, right? Right. So your seventy-four claims you got assigned. That's your money. However you get those closed, that's, you know, you put it in the bank. If you can't close them, then you're gone, right? Right. Even if you're there for two or three weeks. Hurricane Sandy, we had people six weeks into that storm who hadn't closed a claim yet. There was people whenever I left. Ridiculous. When I left Southern Louisiana, you know, after almost five weeks, that I was there and these people got there almost a week before me, they hadn't closed anything. And I'm like, how are they still here? How and they had already had performance cuts. Yeah. So what's a performance cut? Performance cuts basically when you just have a lot of people that are just not cutting it. They're just not getting claims. They're not. They're they're, they're the headaches. They're the people that they're not contacting the insured. 
they're not getting their stuff inspected. They're not getting their claims. They're not getting anything done. Now, with the complexity of some of these claims that some of these guys had down in down in um, southern Louisiana, there's a reason why some of them wouldn't, wouldn't get the claims closed. They were right. big claims. We were just you know they were the steward. They were the, they owned the file all the way through, uh, and it just wasn't going to close. You had ALE. You had all these other things going on with it, so they weren't going to close. But you had some people that had not very severe claims that just weren't getting them closed. But on the performance cuts, that's just basically you suck and they could kick you out. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, and, and along those lines, so Keisha Lindbergh work had a question. She asked, you know, what happens when some of your claims, not necessarily all of them are pulled. So, so you're still on the storm. Yeah. So you're still in the storm. And so, like I said, I had 70 something claims when I first started a couple of weeks into it. Okay, they took some claims off the back end of my schedule. They saw the, what I because one of the best things you can do is and it'll it'll get big points with your managers is, is get your calendar set up, okay, and have all your claims scheduled like you should, and all the notes and file management system or the the claims management system, and they can look at your schedule and say we can take these from him rather than saying hey do you have some we can take off of you. Yeah, you know, yeah. they already know what they can take off of you. They take my oldest claims, the ones that are going to be sitting out the longest. They took those off of me and then reassigned them to somebody else. That way, they could get get done quicker. Right. Okay. While still leaving some on me because we didn't know if I was going to go back out in the field or not. So there's really no reason to touch all those. And so then, as they needed more work for somebody, they would just take a few more off of me because I was staying busy doing quitter claims. You know, and eventually all my claims are gone. You know, and I was just getting the stuff that was just rolling in. So taking claims away from you is not that big a deal. As a matter of fact, if they give you 70-something claims when you first start and you've got them scheduled out, you know, pretty far in advance, you know, pretty far out there. Right. Um, 30, 45 days. Yeah, and because that, that's the way because of people's schedules or whatever, and they're going to get them that far out. It's a relief when they take them off of you. I mean, I was happy. I was like, whew, thank you. I mean, yeah, I mean, it. I knew I was – there was a chance I was going to switch back, switch over a component. And again, it didn't happen. And so the more claims I had to work, the more money I was going to make. But at the same time, and it was a relief because, hey, people are get the longer an insured goes without getting their claim looked at, the more agitated they are when you show up. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There's a direct uh, proportional. Yeah. So, there. you know, and, and even though I was calling people and just kind of, and, I, and plus that they were going, hey, did you ever find a way that you can move me up in the schedule at all? You know, and that was the other thing I was already doing. Even after just a couple of weeks in the field, I was already taking claims from the end of my schedule and moving them forward because I'd be done for the day. And I said, I've got time. I've got my workload is good. Hey, I'm not that far away from you. Can I come out and take care of you today rather than next month? You know, yeah, <laughs> or, you know, two weeks from now. Oh, yeah, come on. You know, and so that's another one I'm getting closed. My numbers are looking good. You got a, you got a happy insured, you know, and your claims load is shrinking, you know, and the day. So a lot of people ask me, well, you had experience. Why did you go down and take hourly? Why did I do that? Well, number one is I hadn't been, I hadn't been on a roof in a year, okay, since my knee surgery. Right. And so I, I didn't want to feel the pressure of having to climb, you know, six roofs a day. I didn't, I didn't want to feel that pressure. Um, and because my skills were, you know, rusty, and there's just several factors there. I thought this is a great opportunity for me to jump back into property. And so that's why I took it. And I'm glad I did it. You know, that way I can actually, when people ask me questions about it, I can tell them the pros and cons of doing it. Um, I would suggest anybody that's their, your first outing, okay, and this is your first shot at it, if you get offered an hourly, whether it be a desk assignment or a field assignment, um, I'd say take it. I mean, I don't think it's a bad, my opinion, I don't think it's a bad thing. No. Now, if you've been doing this for a while and you've got some skills and you're good at it and you're efficient and everything else, I'd say, no, don't do it. Heck no. You know, don't do it. Take that component. Pay. And honestly, they would rather put you on component than have you on hourly. They would much rather have you on component. Pay. Oh, for sure. Because they get a part, they get a piece of that. Right. 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 They would much, I mean, even the carrier would much rather have you on component. Right. Than, than hourly. Because... Even though you're on hourly, you're getting paid hourly by the IA firm, you know, it's the carrier that's picking, that's paying the tab, you know? Right. And then there's a premium on top of that, a percentage that the that the uh, IA firm makes as a profit for managing you in there. It makes you wonder, though, if the IA firm is still sending a fee bill to the carrier anyway and then just giving you an hourly for it. 
So you'd be getting 22 bucks an hour. No, my understanding is, no, I, I know that that's not the case due to the oh, fact good. that, that's good. yeah, due to the fact is that whenever I was injured, you know, they had to tell the carrier, hey, look, this is what we have him doing. And they, and the carrier had to make the decision. It was okay for me to stay. Right. Okay. Um, if I was on component, it wouldn't matter, you know, well, yeah, it's this problem. And by the way, this, this is a question we also have gotten, uh, from, from some people, Carmen Navarro Nakamura asked this question. She said, she asked the pros and cons of hourly rate versus fee schedule, uh, for your first deployment. And we just basically right. just hit that one. Um, she had a, a really good question here and this is kind of a policy related one. Are you, are you? Yeah. Ready to move on? Yeah. Okay. So she says, if your deployment consists of a mandatory evacuation, um, knowing the difference between uh, prohibited use versus additional living expense, yeah. right? Um, under coverage C, or it depends on Which what area? policy, right. loss of use. Um, she says, we'll save you from getting yelled at a lot. A lot. Yes, it will. <laughs> so, you know, in, 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 we'll just take Lake Charles. Yeah. you know, in Southern Louisiana, you had mandatory evacuation, you know, and so um, that prohibited use in ALE for a lot of people ended on the day that the um, mandatory evacuation was over. And you also need to know the difference between what's, in a, what's a habitable house and a house that's not, that's inhabitable. Because uh, a lot of people think that just because a house doesn't have electricity that it's not habitable. Right. That's not the case. That's not the case. If it's got four walls, you know, if a it's roof. 40 degrees below zero. And you can lock it. <laughs> yeah. You can live in it, basically. Yeah. That's, that's the, if you have a way to heat it, air conditioning is a luxury, not a necessity. That is true. That is true. So, and I just pulled up here um, on the screen and this will be. This will show up on the loss of use. Yeah. So if you do a, uh, you, when you pull up a policy, when you, you'll get a package of policies from the, from the, the I firm or the carrier or whatever, and just do a control F once you open up the P, the PDF and start typing stuff in, like in mm -hmm. here, I put pro started typing the word prohibit and it brings up the first thing on here is under coverage D, which in this particular policy is loss of use, whereas what she was talking about was coverage C under that other, it depends, right. on, the, depends the on the carrier. So um, the limit of liability for coverage D is a total limit for the coverages in one additional living expense, two fair rental value, and three civil, civil authority prohibits use below. If we scroll down here to civil authority prohibits use, it tells you exactly what you can do with it, right? So, um, if a civil authority prohibits you from the use of residence premises as a result of direct damage to neighboring premises by apparel insured against, we will cover loss provided in additional living expense and or fair rental value if that applies, right? Well, Above, that fair rental value was an issue on a couple I had. Yeah. So. And it says for no more than two weeks, right? So that on tells that you policy. The, on this policy, right. that's what the limit is. So you got to know, I've never, I don't, I can't think of, offhand how any any big events fires or um hurricanes where the national guard kept you out for more than about two weeks right at the most because even in they're mainly trying to keep people out from looting and well looting but also if the fire is still going they're going right. to keep people out right so um so being able to know how to pull up the policy like this is it will save your rear end a lot, especially if you know how to use the, the search function, right. just finding like finding the word in there. Right. And it'll show all the places where it says. So some policies, it, the, it yeah. separates, it separates prohibited use and additional living expense into two different parts of the policy, or they may have one, depending on the policy and the carrier, one may have a deductible and applies towards a deductible. The other one doesn't apply towards a deductible. Right. At all so you have to know that as well and it's carrier dependent oh yeah you know yeah. what's in there and that's where i saw some people struggle these days there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters with scoper writer programs popping up all over the place you can do photo and scope in the field 
or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. Well, they, 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 they couldn't live in it for this period of time. Well, you know, that ended. Prohibited use ended here, and then if there's any additional living expense, we have to address that here. You know, this is what we're going to pay here, and then right. everything beyond that, we got to figure that out. Well, it ended up half the time that people thought they were going to get additional living expense. They weren't going to get it because their house was still habitable. Right. And it just didn't have... The other thing was, was which that's another subject, was... Everybody in southern Louisiana now owns a generator. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. and they want to get paid for it. Yeah, exactly. And some of them bought two or three generators. Oh, well, yeah. Well, if one's good yeah. and three is yeah. awesome. Yeah, so um, and you had to – there were creative ways that you could find to pay for those, you know, uh, such as if they gave you – how much was the value of the food that they saved? Okay. Uh-huh. So we, if we could, uh, whatever food they saved, we could reimburse them up to the cost of the generator that they bought to help save the food. Um, or the cost of a rental, I'm sorry. What right. would it have cost to have rented a generator up to that amount? Yeah. Okay, not to exceed that cost. There was creative ways of finding, but just to say, okay, here's my receipt for a generator, you know, and then of course they wanted fuel for the, you know, reimburse fuel for right. it, and you had to sit there and nice. it's just, Fun stuff. It's a, it's, yeah, it's a, <laughs> crack the door open a little bit and they want to kick it out all the right. way open. And, and again, with those coverages, I mean, you have to also look at the deck sheet yep. it's just because sometimes they may have an endorsement which gives them like the superstar version of the policy, which may extend that prohibited use thing to four weeks, mm -hmm. right? Or it may, it may change those limits um, in some way that's, that's significant and applicable to your claim. So you have to be, I don't remember who the carrier was. I spoke, had a friend of mine, he was working for a different carrier. What I was working for the day and time in which they said that the, the curfew was, or the, the, or the, I guess curfew or whatever it was, was lifted. Um, that's when your coverage ended. Yeah. For your yeah. prohibited use. Uh, there was one carrier that, allowed an extra 48 hours. Yeah. You know, allowed an extra 48. So if people had traveled when they get back, you know, that sort of thing. So um, read your policies. Read the policy. And again, having your claims taken away isn't a bad thing. Right. If they take them all away, that's a bad that's thing. That's a bad thing. If they're just taking away some of them, it's you're trying to be more efficient and close the claims faster. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Good questions. All right, so here's one for you, Mr. James. Okay. And the only reason it's for you is because when I did this, it was the year 1999, and I couldn't honestly tell you. I can't remember. I know that I okay. failed. Hold on, where is it? What? Man, Alan failed at something? Ha, <laughs> ha. Other than the 11th, I know, other than the 11th grade? Yeah, right. <laughs> hard to believe. Okay, so Rod Helmer asks, Matt, I appreciate all you do. What kind of studying could you actually do to pass a state farm certification without actually having been a carpenter or a home remodeler? Well, prior to COVID-19, when everything was done in one place, now I understand they're doing stuff online, just show up, listen to what the guy's telling you up there. It's basically an open book test to right. begin with. Okay. And it shouldn't be that hard. Just pay attention. 
to what he's saying. Um, you're going to get a practice test, kind of, you know, and they're going to help you with it. And then then you take the test, man. I mean, there's really nothing you can do to prepare for the state farm test. I, at least I don't think there is. I mean, I mean, some of it, because you're not, they're not, so it's based on Xactimate. You know, some of it's based upon, you know, the, the three or four, the code that you would put into, you know, Xactimate, the abbreviations, um, and finding that. And then the rest of it is how State Farm wants to figure their their dimensions. Okay. Right. Um, that was something new to me because I thought there was only one way to measure a roof and there was only one way to measure a wall. <laughs> there's like, no, there's, it's this, you learn Big, the way that they want to do it. State Farm way. Yes, it's the State Farm way. So it, there's no outside study material for that. State Farm is very protective of anything proprietary for State Farm. Um, they will not allow people to take that, copy it, and create some sort of study program and study guide for their stuff. It is you will show up one day and you will go through your go through the material, okay, and then you'll take your test the next day. Yeah, that, that's that's all you can do. And auto is a one day thing. Yeah, I uh, I went to Vail. Like it's called Vail Training Solutions now, but it was yeah. back then it was Vail National. And they're owned by Sedgwick now. That's right. So. And I did uh, the three week residential estimating program, which was I thought was, was a pretty solid course. Um, and that was in the spring of nineteen ninety nine. And then I applied at a bunch of IA firms and then wanted to get certified for state farm because that's what i thought i was had to do right which is what right. everybody's even back then that's what like everybody's like well we're gonna go do state farm claims i guess um the day that i went i took that the the distance learning thing or the whatever i can't remember even what they call it it's probably called the same thing now mm. um my grandma died oh and she was like my favorite grandma my favorite you know whatever we have Right. It was the first person that, you know, I was like in my late twenties, it was the first person that I knew personally that died. And it was, it was a rough time. I completely had bombed the test. Probably got like a 69 out of 70, but I, I failed. You failed. Right. It's past fail. Um, and then I, and then hurricane Floyd hit and everybody that I had gone to, to veil with who all passed the state farm test all went off to hurricane Floyd up in New York or wherever, New Jersey. And I didn't go it at all anywhere. Right. I didn't know that I could, you know, call up other IA firms. I thought it was like, well, you know, pilot's the one I got to go work for and or Worley or whoever it was. Um, and so I didn't end up going to work until the next spring, like the following May. So it was like it was 12 months from when I went to Vail to when I finally got deployed. And I kind of had to beg to get on that that one, which brings me to a, a story about that deployment which um i'm basically just changing whatever subject we were talking what were we talking about you're asking the guy with add i guess i've got add now so on that first deployment i was living in los angeles and i was a associate producer at food network right right which sounds like a cool i mean it was it was a cool job but it was like basically i was a researcher i was on the phone i did some production stuff um but my buddies told me, they're like, Matt, sh Chicago just got hit, which I think to this day is still one of the most expensive hailstorms in history that north hit north northwest Chicago suburbs in May of 2000. Um, so I called in and said, you know, I want to go. And it was because it was such a big storm. They said, all right, well, come on. <laughs> so I quit at the Food Network, which they weren't happy about that because I was like, I basically gave them two minutes notice. I was like, I'm bye, right? And I I grabbed whatever little things that I had, you know, and jumped in the the car, and drove, thirty six hours straight to Chicago from L A. Was that a uh, seventy three Pinto? No, okay. I did have a seventy four Pinto, red, by the way, Whoa. way back in the day, um, my first car. So. I show up, I pull into town, like I've been driving all night long, right? So my eyes are all bloodshot. I've been drinking, you know, eating no dos and you know, drinking energy drinks or whatever. And I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt 
and shorts, khaki shorts and flip flops. And I just come strolling into this state farm cat office in Chicago and kicked open the doors like, here I am, you know, I'm, it's, I've arrived. And everybody in there is wearing red shirts and khaki pants. And I opened up the door and I walked, just kind of walked in and it, you hear like the, it's just like a pin drop. Everybody it's like just, the 80s movie. The guy walks in the bar and the jukebox stops and exactly. everybody turns around Everybody and turned around yeah. and looked at me and like, and then some of them had looks on their faces like, oh boy. And I was like, and this guy wearing, and he was a, wearing a red shirt and khaki pants and everything was standing there talking to somebody and he glanced up and did a double take at me and pointed at me and did this and, you know, come with me. And so I went in, followed him into an office and he's like, who are you? You know, they had, I mean, they had no idea if I was like, you rally, dude, you don't know who I am, bro. You know, I'm <laughs> the famous Matt Allen. And he gave me a dressing down for showing up to any office of, if, that's associated with that IA firm when anything other than a cat shirt and khaki pants and proper shoes and et cetera, et cetera. And he's like, get upstairs, get yourself some shirts, get your gear and we'll give you your claims and you can get out of here. And, and go get to work. And I was like, oh, okay. Did you know that there is an adjuster school out there that has a full catastrophe property claims deployment simulation that you can sign up for for training? Let's talk about this. Veteran Adjusting School in Sedona, Arizona is just such a school. As a licensed vocational school, Veteran Adjusting School trains you to become a complete insurance adjuster. When you graduate from the Voss trained insurance adjuster program, you are ready to begin your exciting new career, whether as a daily adjuster or as a cat adjuster. Listen, there are many outstanding adjuster schools out there and you've got to get trained somewhere. Voss stands out among its peers for the depth and breadth of its program, which is a six week catastrophe deployment simulation complete with claims assignments, insured interactions, real damage that you can scope, as well as its continuing support and mentorship long after graduates become working adjusters, all of which provide a significant advantage to you. I mean, there's truly nothing else like it. Go to adjustertv.com slash VAS now and chat with an enrollment specialist who will answer all of your questions and help you decide if VAS is the right choice for you. Again, go to adjustertv.com slash VAS. Mine was not near that dramatic when I walked in like I said, so here's what happened to me whenever, so we, we went over how I, I show up. Okay. I was, first I'm told to be there on Saturday. Then I get a phone call. Where are you? So then I go ahead and I go down. I get, uh, I get my RV set up, you know, get up the next day. I'm trying to reach my manager on the phone. Can't reach my manager, but I have an address to report to. Um, so I go to that address, you know, I just, Drive on over because, you know, this is where it says you're going to be. So I assume this is where my peeps are at. I walk in. There's a guy wearing a State Farm shirt, you know, and some other people. I said, hey, yeah, I'm looking for, you know, some, well, um, they're out here. You need to go outside around the corner. Uh, a few minutes be a guy out there at a, a table, and uh, you'll get your gear. I'm like, all right, cool. So I go over there, and bam, they give me my box, you know, and I got all my gear. I'm like, well, what do I do now? And they go, call your IA firm. Well, they're not here. No, they're not here. Huh. I'm like, okay. So I call my manager. Finally, I get my manager on the phone. What are you doing here? Who told you to go pick that up? I'm like, well, I just went to the address that I had. Who gave you that address? It's on the uh, it's on the company app as the address to report to. Well, you're not even supposed to be here today. Well, well when I talked to somebody yesterday, they said, go ahead and come on down, and they'd get me started early. I'll call you back. I'm waiting, okay? I wait an hour. Yeah. Well, then I run into somebody and say, oh, by the way, this is where that company's at. I'm like, okay. So I drive to that hotel. I get to that hotel. I see this person that's on the phone. She looks like the person's picture that's on my app that's going to be my manager. She gets off the phone. I go, hey, I'm James Mathis. She goes, what are you doing here? Who told you to come here? <laughs> I'm like, well, why is that just like the predominant question around right. here? She goes, well, hang on a second. We'll get this figured out. And then a few minutes later, she comes out. She goes, hey, so uh, do you have an alias? Yeah, I have an alias. 
what is it? And I told her my alias. She goes, wow, that's a low number. How long have you been doing this? It's my first deployment for this company. Well, how'd you get that alias? I used to work in work for State Farm office. Oh, then that means you're not set up for that means you're not set up to do uh, adjusting. You're gonna have to call State Farm and get your alias switched over. So next thing you know, I get a text message from somebody. I don't even know who this is. It says, call this person. They can get a change for you. I call that person. She gets and says, oh, yeah, you're already set up. Everything's fine. She goes, well, while you're there, let me go ahead and set your computer up for you. So I'm on the phone with her. She gets all my logins done. We get my computer set up. Everything's good. Now here it is. What do I do? You know, this is Thursday. I'm not supposed to be there till, you know. You're right. Saturday. I walk into the... I walk into the big room there in the war room. I go, dude, what are you doing here? You know, why don't you just leave? You know, nothing for me to do there. I said, well, I'm just going to hang out for a little bit, just kind of listen and see what's going on. I'm sitting there, and there's this young lady. It's her first deployment. She's never done this, never, never, never even touched anything with a claim. She goes, yeah, I've got these people. They live in this house, and, man, it's got mold everywhere, and it's got, it's got – water spots on the ceiling and I just had to tell them that we don't pay for water damage no matter what Whoa. I'm like what, <laughs> what are you talking about no matter what they go yeah what I'm part like, of the policy is that I'm mm-hmm. like going oh well, we don't well, we don't pay for mold we, we and then I, and then there's nothing I can do I said let me see your photos she show, shows me your photos and she shows me the water stains on the ceiling I said, okay, so let me explain something to you. Yeah, they don't cover mold, okay? But they got to do something about that ceiling, okay? And there's wet, there's wet uh, insulation above it. You got to replace all that, okay? So we're not going to pay to remediate the mold, but we're going to stop the cause of the mold. Right, Okay, right, and exactly. we can get rid of that. And then when they get rid of that, they can, you know, they just got to pay out of their pocket to spray the stuff on there. Right. <laughs> the fungicide, and, and it's covered. Oh, wow. Are you sure? Because I just asked that manager over there, and he told me that, no, we're not paying for mold. Well, of course. Like you know, you I said, said, did you show him your pictures? He goes, yeah, I showed him my pictures. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So she goes over to the manager and says, hey, can't we do this, this, and this? And the guy goes, yeah, who told you that? That guy did. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> and that was pretty much how I ended up, after my first day, being the guy that whenever the managers were too busy, go talk to that guy. Go talk to that guy. I'm like, hey, man, it's my first I hope deployment. you got some steak dinners out of that. Got nothing, Dang. man. I got nothing. Nothing but a bunch of... Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but that was my first show up on a, on a deployment. Yeah. You know, yeah. that was my... So then the next day, of course, that was Thursday. Then Friday comes along, and I'm like, well, you know, I got nothing to do. And so I fished all day Friday. Nice. And... uh Got paid to fish all day long. And uh, I mean, I went to the war room for a little while. And then, you know, so I got kind of done here and I went and fished the rest yeah. of the day. Uh-huh. And then, of course, Saturdays, they were supposed to start. So, okay, getting paid. Okay, you know. <laughs> Carmen has another question. What I firm will allow Gabby. you to work as a team, husband and wife? I don't know that there is a firm that won't let you do that. Okay. Um, but there's a caveat. There's some caveats. There's some rules. You both got to be licensed. You both got to be certified by that company. Right. You both got to be on the rosters. You both got to be background checked and approved by the carrier. Exactly. So, you know, if, if you go do it for State Farm, then you both have to be, have passed the State Farm certification. Right. And you both have to be, quote unquote, officially deployed. Right. That way you're covered under workers' comp and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, especially if you're we're doing stuff for... A W-2 firm. So I would say also that people, you know, we're just talking about teams in general, which I think is kind of a good co- topic because I think it's... Oh, do I have a story on yeah. teams? So well, let's hear the story. So there was a group of people who showed up together. There was three people that rode together to this deployment. They had one car. And they were just going to do everything as a team. Like just, just like tag team, just like show up to the house, house, yeah, and just, just, just do them all together. And that was their. We tried that one time. That was their, that was their plan until they found out that one of the persons, their claims were a hundred miles away from where the other two's claims were. 
And now they got to figure this problem out. Yeah. Somebody's buying a $4,000 car. Well, it ends up that they just left. All three of them just left. I mean, well, come on. Well, it's just... Because I thought it was ridiculous that they couldn't put them together to work so they could work together. Let's, let's, let's run through the math on this. All right. If you're getting $350 per and you split that three ways, what are you getting? 115 bucks a piece or whatever? Yep. Is that worth it? No. You know. You're not you're not beating the system that way. You have to do three times as many claims every day, and you just I not, said, hey, we can work together and tag team. Just use one car and all drive together and spend no. all our days together. Days not they're staying in the same hotel room. This is all great. We just share expenses. We're staying at the hostel, man. No, come on. Yeah. No. So here's the deal with teams. When you work as a team, my experience, and I've done it several different ways, most different ways. I've tried that like. Me and my buddies are all going to, there's three of us out there are going to try and do, I did that for like three days and it was like a cluster. I've done it where one guy sits in the truck and one guy scopes. Also, you know, the two way radio, walkie talkie, whatever didn't work out very well because if, if, if they're my claims and I'm scoping and I'm dealing with the insured, he's not writing up the estimate the way I, I would write it up. Right. And it, the, the, your managers will notice, they'll know. Right, because if if I have if I use spell check and he doesn't ever my the notes are all have typos and misspellings, yep. that kind of stuff. Right. In my experience, when you're trying to do a volume of claims, what you want to do as a team is to figure out the things that that are a drag on your time. Right. Being on the phone, it's a drag on your time. Labeling photos. Labeling photos is a drag on your time. Checking voicemail, checking emails, doing, you know, calling people back to confirm appointments and things like that. So personally, I find that the best use of a team situation is to have the adjuster basically outsource their desk, which we call it their desk, which is all the admin work, all the all the stuff that they're that is not directly related to scoping and estimating the loss, right? Right. Outsource that to somebody who just hangs out at home or in the truck or in the hotel room or wherever, right? They don't have to be with you because they're going to be dealing with your phone basically. Right. So if nor, if I'm by myself and my normal thing is a time block out, you know, from eight o'clock in the morning until noon, I'm going to scope and write, you know, I'm going to do work on, field work and then for <clears throat> an hour and 15 minutes after that i'm going to get on the voicemail make callbacks and do all that kind of stuff and do some admin work in the computer get caught up a little bit in there and then finish out the afternoon from 1 30 to 6 in the field and then do some admin work after that if i have an assistant i'm not doing any admin work during the day i'm just i'm in the field from eight o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock in the right. afternoon Right. And so I can get a lot more work done as an individual and pay that person a day rate or an hourly or if they're my spouse, then we're just, you know, it's it's all going into the same. Right. Whatever. Um, I think personally that that's the best way. to. And I would say to take that even farther, a husband and wife team who both run claims and they, you know, when, when you go in to your firm and you say, you know, we're a husband and wife team. We both are trained. We both, we showed up at the, the, the training together, the certifications together, yada, yada, yada. We're, they, we get deployed to the same events in the same town. We're not going to be a hundred miles away from each other. If those people, like if, if my wife became an adjuster and we decided to go out on the field and do, you know, on the road and do cat work, if she got her license and got certified and everything, we would hire an assistant to take care, to look after both of our desks and we'd go out and scope and write individually all day long right and some husband and wife teams do that they'll either go together and try to like split the work up or they'll just take their own claims and just like he's over there she's over there and then they come home at the end of the day and have dinner and right, right. if you have an assistant that takes care of all the phone call all, all the phone work all the email stuff and everything takes that off of their plate then they have two incomes coming in at the same time right right instead of trying to like split things up like with your buddy, like she's, she's talking about husband and wife teams here. But if you have like your friend and you want to go like, well, I can do five a day and you can do five a day. So together we're going to do 10. You're still making the same amount of money. Right. And it's going to be 
chaos, right? Even if the only way I think that would work is if, if you know, you could do five a day, I could do five a day, but together we can do 15, 15 or 20, right? Maybe, right? But not, probably not, unless you're like super experienced and super skilled at it, but then you're probably still going to do it your own. See, way. I'm at the point in my life that if I did the husband and wife team thing, okay, we would just probably split the duties, okay? Yeah. Try to, that way I could maybe do an extra, you know, claim or two a day. But at the same time, spend less time working. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be my goal. Yeah. I'm like, hey, man, let's 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 go work, but let's just you know split some duties and and just take it easy while everybody else yeah. is killing themselves, and we can make enough money doing this. Then why don't we do it this way? Listen, that's you know that's perfectly valid, and the reason why is because especially when you when you're on the road for four, five, six eight, nine, 12 months that's, in a row. Yeah. That's your day to day life. If you work seven days a week for nine months in a row, yeah. you're going to be just thrashed by the end of that. You're not going to be worth anything. I couldn't imagine the year I had this year that if my wife and I were out on the road together, working the schedule that I worked, you know, this year yeah. and we we're both working that schedule and then we go home for what little bit of time we're home. And then we both have all this stuff that needs to be, caught up and taken care of while we're home for a short period of time. I, I can't imagine what that would, the strain that would put on the relationship. Yeah. You know, cause we still have a home and we have to deal with, you know, versus, Hey, you know what? If you take on these duties, I'm out here doing this, you take on this part of it. And by the way, those things that we can take care of remotely that has to do with our home and things back home and you're doing that, you know, and, and when that allows us to knock out, let's say that that just makes us 50% more efficient, yeah. you know, and so rather than doing seven claims a day, I'm doing, you know, 10 or 11 a day. You know what? Rather than doing 14 a day that two of us could do. Right. I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that because now I might, it might only, because I've got her taking care of part of this and I'm only doing 10 a day or whatever, but it's only taking me eight to nine hours to do it. That's better than doing 10 claims and it's taking me 14 hours to do it. Yeah. yeah. And I got time for steaks at night with her. So. Right. So, and it just as a note about 10 claims a day, I get a lot of pushback from people when, when they ask you, well, how many should I be doing? How much is an experience adjuster? How many claims are you doing a day? And some people that ha have asked that, have asked that question that they want to have it answered on this, this podcast. Hey, hey. Mr. Insured, how's it going? It's going great today. How are you doing? <laughs> right. This is actually... Guy Grand from Veteran Adjusting School. So you want to learn claims from the most experienced veteran adjusters, but you can't find anybody who will let you ride along with them? Then let me tell you about Adjuster TV Plus. Developed by Adjuster TV and its industry partners, including the high-end training center Veterans Adjusting School in Arizona, Adjuster TV Plus is a growing library of in-depth training videos created just for independent adjusters. Learn scoping and estimating from professional trainers and adjusters. Learn how to handle customer interactions with confidence. Learn the ins and outs of scoping and estimating exterior hail claims. And detailed videos about how to handle smoke, ice dam, water claims, and auto claims. Adjuster TV Plus also features the very best of three years of Adjuster TV's YouTube videos. Educational, entertaining, and inspiring. Come ride along with us on Adjuster TV Plus. And I'm going to say that when we talk about, again, being efficient and spending less time doing each individual task in the, in, per one claim, in the claims workflow, if, when you get really good at that, you can do 10 claims a day. It's still a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's not like, you know, you're just lollygagging at 9, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and then you're done for the rest of the day, right? This is, you know, 7 a.m., 7 to 9 a.m., whatever, to you're running out of light or you're getting ready to run out of light. You got to have some light to see. Okay. It's You can do it in the middle of the summer a lot easier than you can early spring, late fall, right. kind of, or, you know, fall, whatever. Um, it's absolutely possible. The more familiar you get with, with uh, your carrier, I don't care who it is. I did this with State Farm. I've done it with Allstate, and they, both of those companies have a lot of compliance, a lot of things you gotta do. I can still close a claim in an hour. 54 items is what, it, 54 tasks is what it takes to close 
a state farm yeah. plane. When you know the system, you know everything that needs to be in there, you have your uninterrupted, distraction-free workflow, you can do it, right? It's not that hard to do. It's hard to, to get up to that point, but once you figure it out, you can do it. Again, <clears throat> it's a lot of work. It doesn't mean it's hard, it just means it's a it's lot. It's a lot. Right? It's not sustainable, I would say, and it ends up, this, a lot of the time, it's not necessary to be sustainable. Usually what I'll do, if I'm gonna decide to do 10 claims in a day, or 11, right? It's that I wanna get caught up, right? So I'll go out, and, I, and I'll, they'll be hand-picked claims that will allow me to be successful. I'll say, I know that there's no hail in this area. Or it was fringe, it was light, and the roof, their houses are all brand spanking new, right? The one-year-old right. roofs, pea-sized hail, those are going to be pretty easy to, to like, I'm going to spend time there and look and make sure because I don't want to have something come back up. But in the back of my mind, I already know that I'm probably going to be saying no on those houses. It's less time. Right. right. So I'm, it might take me 25 to 35 minutes to do one of those door to door start to finish. Right. And then I'll have it throw in a couple of the ones to take me an hour and 15 minutes to do. Right. right? And over the course of the day, and my phone calls are all caught up. I'm not making phone calls and stuff like that unless I absolutely have to on that on a day where I'm doing ten. So it's it's a it's a production and it's a, an event. I might do that two days in a row, and then go back down to doing seven a day. Well, my point is, if I've got somebody taking care of all that administrative stuff, phone calls, yeah, file it's a updates, lot easier. file updates, things like that, way easier. And all I'm doing is photoscoping, writing estimates, you know, yeah. and closing claims. Then, then, yeah, that's and I and I'm and I use the ten claims a day thing just as kind of a throwing a number out there right i'm just talking about increasing efficiency to where i can knock out a few extra a day right you know and still have time exactly to, to enjoy a day or or work like that for a few days and then take a day full day off not have to sweat it exactly exactly and, that, and that's my my, my point in, in using that number because it's it's something that does come up and i'm not talking about scoping 10 to all you know 10 claims and then go back to my hotel room taking a nap, taking a shower, eating some, you know, late lunch or early dinner, and then staying up till 11 o'clock writing them. When I get back to the hotel room at the end of the, a 10 claim, done. I'm done. They're all, I'm, I'm hitting upload on Xactimate, and I'm gonna eat dinner and watch, you know, just get on the phone with somebody or watch right. TV for 30 minutes and I'm going to bed. I'm not, you know, if, and again, this goes back to staying, if you're out on cat for months at a time, you're getting. You're going to be good at at this. You're going to get good at it to where you can be fast, and you're not going to want to get four hours of sleep every night. You're going to want to get your seven and a half to, to nine and a half hours of sleep every single night. And you can do ten claims a day for a short period of time and still get sleep. I close claims on site no matter what. I don't care what if they want me to write checks or if it's just photo and scope or whatever. I'm going to close that claim on site. The only claims that I don't close on site or that I generally don't close on site are going to be large loss right. claims or commercial, like big commercial groups. Like if it's like a rental property, a house, and it's got, it's just like a resident, then that one's getting closed on site. If it's 19 apartment buildings, I'm going to scope all those one day and then I'm going to take the next day and write them up. So it's a two day deal on like a big apartment complex. Right. Um, I can't, and again, I, this is something I get pushed back on from people. Why do this job if you can't maximize every possible way to close as many claims as you can with that high quality technical you know, accuracy, with the high quality customer service, right? Why would you do this job? Why, why it's not worth it, in my opinion, right? All right. So that's what always drew me back was that I was, it was a challenge to figure out how I could get my, my told my, from the time I knock on that person's door to the time I, I've handed them a check to get that under an hour on most losses was like, that was my life's work for a number of years. And I got it down. I could do those between 40 and 50 minutes, almost any hail claim. Right. Right. And it was, the, those were the salad days. <laughs> That's for sure. Because I could consistently close. I, I had a guy that on claim on one of the claims I had on my house, from the time the guy showed up to the time that he handed me a check, forty five minutes. Yeah, yeah. And, Macros, and it was, and it, yeah. Cuts. I mean, it, and there was, 
there was, I mean, like grills were jacked up, fence was jacked up. I mean, yeah. the guys got in there and just got out of his way, let him do his thing, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's the same thing over and over and over again. The, the better you get at it, the more you do it, the more repetition, mm-hmm. the faster you go. And it's not, and it's when, it, again, using the word speed, it's the less time you're taking to do a thing. It's not like you're we're running around. Doing this guy stuff. was a pig farmer from North Carolina. It was, and he was a, when he wasn't a duster, he was a pig farmer. Yeah. Got in, got out, yeah. got it done. So, is that like a pig joke of some kind? I could come up with one. <laughs> so I had this one. You had this one. It's actually a, it was a very very big commercial. It would have been a, it would have been a massive claim. It was I was when I got assigned this I, and I knew the town well enough to know because it, it'll say like such and such you know LLC whatever. Gray Gardens, you know, apartment complex, whatever. I was like, oh, yes. And then I looked at the address and I was like, maybe. Because <laughs> it was in the fringe, right? Or maybe even a little outside of the fringe. I met these two guys, contractors, and they were the ones that generated this claim, right? They were the ones that went, their canvassing, or they, they, they were looking for big, like big paydays. It's the million dollar Apple thing, right? They're, instead of like trying to sell all the apples in the bin for a dollar a piece. It's the kid with the sign that says, apples, $1 million a piece. All I gotta do is sell one, right? Um, they were, they met me on this and these, these kids, and they were kids, they were like 20. They, they rolled up in, you know, jalopy pickup truck, you know, try, they're, they're contractors, right? And this is a, there was a lot of buildings, there were three stories, you know, they were big, it was a, gonna be a huge, Whoever, if it, if it was something that, that was, if they were totaled for, for hail, it would have been a massive payday for everybody. But we get up on this roof and these guys are like, and they're new, there's like their two-year-old buildings, right? So it's not a very old complex. And they are, you know, the one guy is, is the, the voice, like the brains of the operation. And the other kid was like the strong, silent type. And he was making circles all over the place on the shingles. He was making circles with nothing in them. Like he'd make a circle and I'm like hoping, I'm like, come on, oh, please, please. Cause this is going to be a big, fat, juicy one. And I'm, you know, following around behind him and I'm touching the, sh- the shingle inside the, his circle where he's, he's like, yeah, well, here's one, here's one, here's one. He's making circles all over the place and there's nothing, there's not even loose granules. Right. And I'm like, okay, all right take a picture of it you know i put a little i always make a little mark on like contractor stuff like uh-huh. I put a little line under it or a dot or something and i'll take a picture so later i can label it as contractor thinks it's you know stated that he thought this was hail right. whatever and then not consistent with hail is what i'll like add to that and so i'm like get to like five or six of these and i'm like you know I'm, i go and look at like the chimney the chase covers and the the flue caps and you know metals vents and things like that up on there if there's no spattering on anything there's no dents on anything it's like brand new it's like you know and it's I, and i was like i was like guys i mean I, i'm i uh, i really want to like you know work with you on this one but i mean i what you're circling here i'm not i'm, I'm struggling to find something that is consistent with hail hit and they both they lost their minds it, i might as well have just said you know just made bad comments about their mamas uh, question their heritage yeah, yeah exactly and the point of this story is that one of the guys he's like you know i was like basically i mean you're, you're making circles that have nothing in them i can't i can't turn in this file and total these roofs out without some evidence that there's some damage to it well you know you know a guy that a guy like you i mean he, he you know he's a what did the, what the heck did he say he was like you know, somebody might want to take a swing at him. We're at 36 feet up off the ground, right? With yeah. no rail or anything. And I was like, we're done here, gentlemen. <laughs> I was like, get down. Well, you know what I mean? I was like, down, now, we're off this roof. You don't, you, if, yeah. if you threaten me, we're, this is over. Like, how, what part of, nego- where do you negotiate from there? Right? right. And so they climbed down off the roof, um, that was my ladder. How did I have a ladder that was that high on that storm? Anyway, 
<laughs> and they were the farther away they got from me, the more louder they yelled and the more dumb things that they started screaming and yelling at me. And I called the the owner, and I was like, "Listen, I, I want to first of all, I want to apologize." You know, I explained the whole situation, and he started apologizing. He's like, "I'm so sorry. Those guys, they made, they really, you know, they they really really wanted to look at the the roof. They said there was damage and everything, and they wanted to meet you." And, da, da, da. and I was like, "Well, listen, I have no problem. We have no. There's nothing that stops me from if you have damage from just." taking care of it right it's more or less what i said i said but there's there's not anything up here and and one of the guys you know threatened to take a swing at me but just out of the blue there was like zero it wasn't even like a like a maybe this maybe that it was there was nothing there the roofs are in pristine condition there's nothing wrong with him he's like well that's all i really care about called the agent you know explained it to him and then closed the file but those guys i mean occasionally contractors will just lose it right? right and this is this is the other side of it from the adjuster side i mean the guy had an old trick up truck it's not like he had a truck payment to make right exactly you know it's not exactly. like he was driving a big super duty with thousand dollar a month payment yeah so you know i mean and i've had other guys you know they, they'll start to to you know well you know we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to request an adjuster who actually knows what he's doing you know we're going to do this we're going to do that uh, you know somebody who's not a, a complete beginner and da, 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 da. and they start they they're trying to get you like they're poking at you right. trying to get you to like explode or whatever and you can't you can't take you any can't of that do stuff it personally. man and it's, i i i it's just business i have you know especially early in my career you know you get defensive about well i absolutely do know what i'm doing you know and then you start to it, and then it's all off to the races the worst thing that happens is that the insurer is standing there watching this exchange and he doesn't know who to trust. The contractor right. wants to make money. The insurance company wants to save money. I don't know what to do. And they're yelling at each other in front of me, right? right. What would you do as a homeowner if that happened? You'd probably, I would kick them both off my property and yeah, I'd make phone calls and just start jump. You get on the phone, right. Right? right? So as an independent adjuster, do you feel like you only have bad expensive choices for health insurance plans? And when you have to use the insurance, you'll have to pay a lot out of pocket. Makes you wonder why you even have insurance in the first place. The stakes are high. Having no coverage puts you and your family at risk. It doesn't have to be this way. You want peace of mind with common sense health coverage you can count on. That doesn't include things you don't need. You need real insurance with world-class protection from established carriers. Not health sharing and not cobbled together prepaid medical. And you shouldn't have to wait for it. Get approved in days, not weeks. There is no risk and no cost to see if you qualify for these high quality plans. Not everybody will qualify, but you've got nothing to lose by getting a free consultation. Visit adjustertv.com slash health for more information and to apply. This is Adjuster TV. Got to Got to keep your cool. You have to not take things personally, 100%. And if, and if that guy is blowing up at you and you're the adjuster and you're very calmly and, and you're being respectful and friendly and not like, you know, getting jabs in or being sly or slick or whatever, you're just like, you know, maybe we can, you know, convene this meeting and, and, and pick it up at some other time. You know, maybe you could, whatever. Right. Because you're standing in front of the homeowner and the homeowner wants to, if, if you're the one that's staying calm and cool, you're the you're gonna win. You're gonna win, right. even if you don't even say anything. If you just stand there and yes, sir, uh huh, let me write the I'll take your concerns down. Okay, you know, yes, I'm a total asshole, you know, and my mama wears combat boots and right. whatever, you know. But my mom does. Yeah. Okay. My mom wears cowboy boots. Okay. So, I had this one. It was um, just in the last month. Uh, received this, you know. It was one of those that started off as just a photo and scope, and then it ended up being a photo scope estimate, just close the thing, get it out of here kind of claim. And so when I first saw him, being as on both sides of this business, selling insurance and claims, when I saw the name of the insurance company come across, I knew immediately that this was not a standard homeowner's policy. This was a single interest policy if you know what that is. I don't. So basically a single interest policy. It, it, so when you have a homeowner's insurance, when you have homeowner's insurance, it covers the homeowner and it also insures the mortgage company right. from that loss. Protects their- single interest is whenever you don't fulfill your contract and your mortgage company 
takes out a policy on the home and it protects the mortgage company's interest, not yours as the homeowner. So in other words, it basically just covers the dwelling right. and that's it, nothing else. So we get this claim and, and uh, I go inspect it and I'm reading, I mean, I'm reading my guidelines. Okay, I'm reading the policy, I'm reading the claim notes, and I'm saying, okay, this is what they expect me to do. Um, this is one of those claims I get via an app from a company. And so I'm like, okay, I am to inspect this roof, I am to mark all damages and to, and to document all damages to the structure. Uh, they say there was a water leak in two bedrooms. I get there, there's a water leak in three bedrooms. One was actually an addition to the house, where when they made the addition and they made it on the back of the house and they enclosed around the, the chimney, the water's coming down around the chimney, which is yep. brick. And anyway, um, but, but it hasn't, it used to leak, but it doesn't, it hasn't leaked in months. But, you know, we just want to point that out since they're sending somebody out here for damage. Well, it ends up that this policy is only been in force since September. Okay. Right. They're just now reporting this water damage in this one room. I walk in this room and sure enough, right above the bed, there's a big old water stain. There's a hole in the center of it, you know, of the water stain. And so, okay, now I know where it's at. I document everything, scope the rooms, measure them, do my sketches, go outside, <coughs> do my, do my routine, you know, I always start on the ground and then go to the roof, you know, so I get on the roof. I'm looking on the roof, trying to determine where this water's coming from on this roof. I can't find it. Okay. I see some damage where a limb fell off the tree, neighbor's tree, hit the side of the house, damaged a couple of shingles. That's not where the leak is coming from. Uh, the leak in the other room, it was a deteriorated boot, uh, jack boot right. is what it was. So I was, I took a picture of that, documented it. You know, but that first room I just can't figure out where it's coming from. I'm looking around the roof. Roof's got hell damage to it. So I go through and I do my test squares. It says document all damage. I look at soft metal damage, everything else. But the gutters, I'm not finding any damage on the gutters. But the gutters are full of leaves. I mean, they are packed. These gutters have not been cleaned out since probably the 80s. <laughs> okay. And that's when it hit me. That's where the water got into the one bedroom. The water backed up because of the, the gutters. Yep. And I went down there, checked it out. Sure enough, man, it's rotted through there. Everything else, damage over time, lack of maintenance, ain't covered. Right, yeah. It ain't covered. So anyway, I've got to write all this up and everything else. Homeowner comes out. So uh, what'd you see, you know? And uh, no, I noticed some hell damage up there and I noticed this and I noticed this and this is what I found. Oh, great. So I can call my contractor out here and get a roof, right? No, you can't. Oh, why? Well, the hell, there's been no hell in this neighborhood for two years. Right, right. Okay, and that was before this policy took effect. You know, what do you mean? And I had explained it to him. What do you mean? Oh, boy. And so <laughs> then I, well, what about the damage to the inside of the house? Well, this is the problem is you haven't maintained the house and this is what it is. You're telling me you're denying this? And I'm like, yeah, under the terms of the policy, I can't cover it. You know, and plus that, even if we did cover it, okay, um, you know, the, everything's going to, I said, it's the, it's the bank who gets to decide who comes out and does the repairs, not you. Right. Because right. this is, well, it's my homeowner's policy, sir. It's not your homeowner's policy. You know, and I had to explain all this to this guy standing right there in his yard. It was not a happy camper. Okay. I write it up, send it in, get a phone call back from the, from the, uh, I guess he's the desk review guy from the carrier. Dude was just happy as could be that how I did it. He goes, by the way, in the future, when you go out on one of these policies, never mark hell. Unless we tell you, Mark Hell. I said, well, my instruction said, document all damage right. on the roof. And they go, yeah, and that opens up another can of worms uh -huh. for them. And so, anyway, I think they're going to end up going, subrogating on the previous. Um, I think they're going to put a roof on it, but then right. they're going to subrogate to the previous carrier 
that had the coverage on the roof really? at the time that it happened. Yes. Which, Interesting. So, and, and that come, brings up another topic. I mean, I'm, basically my story is over on that. But back when I sold roofs, okay, we actually had a – where people had just purchased the home. Um, they just purchased it, just moved into it. We're replacing the neighbor's roof. The guy says, hey, we just bought this house. Come take a look at ours. Sure enough, there's hail damage on the roof. So during the home inspection, pre-purchase inspection, the inspector didn't didn't uh, document the damage on the roof. And so he contacts his insurance company. The insurance company says, we're not covering that because we didn't. We just put the policy on it. And so luckily, we discovered who the previous insurance company was, contacted that company. They came out and took care of it. Yeah. Yeah, and they went back to the previous seller because it wasn't disclosed damage, and got them to pay for the uh, the deductible. Listen, home inspectors so. of the world, let me just tell you something: if you're not trained on a hail, don't be looking at roofs for a hail damage. Yeah, because I can't tell you the number of claims I've had where the homeowner is like, "Oh yeah, the home inspector said we had hail damage, so we gotta. That's why you're here." Yep. And I'm up there and I'm looking at it. Like, there's not any, it's nothing that's looks even remotely like and this guy said there was nothing and this roof was just tore up. Yeah. yeah. So nothing against those guys. Cause they have a lot of expertise that we don't have a lot of deep expertise that we don't have. Um, but when it comes to restoration stuff, I, I encourage them all to get hail trained right. so that they know, take the hail roof inspector, you know, or the Hague certified roof inspector, thing get that credential because that'll help the insurance companies and the adjusters later when you do go up on a roof and you see some spots that you think you know oh well spots are you know i must mean hail hit it and knock the granules out or whatever then if you're trained on it you're certified on it then you can say oh well that actually isn't hail that's where a bunch of it's underneath where an old tree was i see this the stump on the ground out there you know a four foot diameter stump and there's a bunch of missing granules in spots where there was moss and lichen that after they cut the tree down, the sun killed it and it fell off, taking granules with it, leaving black spots. You see that all the time. Right. Right. And it's got a clear view of the sky and everything. Well, I mean, obviously the hail could have just made that, you know, but no, there was a tree there because those spots only go in, a, in an area where the tree was hanging over the right. roof. Right. And they're calling that hail. I mean, contractors constantly call that hail. Yeah. But they're always saying that. You, you, if you look up hail damage to roofing shingles on Google, You'll see pictures of that on like professional websites of roofing contractors. You know, make sure you double check for hail damage, and here's some photos of hail damage, and it's light moss lichen spots, yep. or footfalls, or it's none of it's hail. Right. So that's what I would say. If those guys generate a lot of work for everybody. I shouldn't. I'm not, and I don't want to like start a fight with home inspectors. Right. And I think those are great guys. So, this was just an inst- right. instance where, hey, I just missed it. You know, yeah, and, and anybody honest, can miss it. I mean, anybody. And can I'll be it. honest with you, this was a pretty steep roof. Okay, yeah. so he may have just ladder inspected it, right? You Which know? is nothing wrong with that. At and, all. and I, I do and that. I wouldn't blame the guy for it. But yeah, I just happened to whenever I put my ladder on it, I just came up to the right spot. I mean, matter of fact, when I went up and looked at it the first time, I ladder inspected it too. But I saw enough from the ladder that like, yeah, this tore up. Yeah, and he probably just went on one side of it, wrong side, and that's it. Yeah, so cool guy. Are you ready for? Your most favorite segment of the show. Yes. All right. All right. Let's see here. And we have. Hit me. What is brown and sticky? What is brown and sticky? (laughs) A stick. If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast.